Okay, so here we have uh, today's lecture that I was going to give in class, uh, but as you saw from the email and hopefully through the history department, I couldn't make it. We're going to finish up our talk about the English colonies and kind of then talk about colonial culture. Uh, next week we're going to talk about um, the British Empire as an institution before we finally get into the American Revolution and thereafter. So we already talked about the Chesapeake colonies, uh, which were very limited by disease, uh, life expectancy, a um, lot of immigration, uh, and these sort of strange households that would emerge. Uh, you know, a stepmother, a, a woman who, whose husband would die uh, might have children with that husband before he dies, and she remarries to a man who has children from his previous marriage because his wife died, um, and he likely dies before she does. She remarries again, has children with her new husband, carries along the children from both her previous husband's marriages and her marriage to create these very um, unusual families, uh, unusual by our time, but necessary for the time in which they were living. Um, we talked a little bit about the Plymouth colony, which began as a separatist colony from Great Britain uh, due to religious strife and uh, the perception that their religion was not welcome in Britain. Um, although once other colonies in the Americas were established, it became a part of the British colonies. Um, and they always pretty much considered themselves British, just... Uh, they felt that their religion was persecuted. The Plymouth colony had a very rough foundation. Uh, it almost didn't survive, which seems to be kind of the, you know, the narrative. We have the Jamestown colony uh, almost failing as well. So um, Plymouth remained a small, weak, and poor colony for most of its, its time. Uh, this is, you know, a, the image from the Mayflower of the colonists praying for deliverance on their way over. They actually spent the first winter uh, aboard the ship and not really in the colony. Uh, this is what sort of the political map of who the various Native American tribes were in New England at the time. Uh, the Wampanoags were the tribe that the Plymouth settlers encountered. Uh, there was the Narragansett tribe, the Massachusetts tribe, Nimchuk tribe, the uh, Mohegan tribe, um, and smaller tribes in Connecticut um, and tribes in sort of the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, most of these tribes actually were suffering themselves from depopulation, uh, from disease, probably through contact with the colonial powers. So what about the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which became one of the more successful colonies uh, after a time? Um, so again, it was founded by Puritans, and uh, they established their colony along religious lines, um, and sort of the social order was defined by religious alienation. So um, colonial duties and relations were usually defined by religion. Um, they did, however, have a representative government uh, where the leaders would be elected every few years from among the colony members. Uh, and this led to greater stability because you didn't have someone sort of ruling for a long time, uh, them dying, and then the establishment, you know, several years of disorder while a new ruler is established. Um, and because it was representative government, the, they were used to the rulers changing every few years, and the change in ruler wasn't that shocking to them on a hierarchical level. Uh, the colony quickly outgrew itself. Um, and they would at times uh, ally with Native American tribes to defeat other Native American tribes in order to um, expand their territory. Within a few years of expansion, the Massachusetts Bay Colony at least incorporated, you know, sort of de facto um, most of eastern Massachusetts uh, into probably the, uh, the Worcester area today, so about, you know, central Mass. Uh, but, you know, sort of 
de jure by law they they controlled most of the entire Massachusetts area with the Native American tribes living there you know in theory living there under their direction um, although it was quite a large colony it was sparsely settled and I should point that out that you know you'd have towns that would have one or two families living in the town uh, that would be quite small so you could have a town in the middle of a territory that was predominantly Native American, but it would be a colonial presence in that territory. Uh, and even today in parts of Massachusetts, you know, if you're hiking through the woods, you'll come across the remains of what used to be a town. Um, you'll come across, you know, a few houses uh, down to the foundation or walls that used to wall off um, farms, uh, which shows you that, you know, these areas used to be settled and then now back have reverted back to wilderness. And it also shows you how small these settlements were. Um, all was not perfect in this colony, and despite the fact that it was founded as a religious haven, uh, religious dissent led to the establishment of the Rhode Island colony in the territory formerly held by the Narragansett tribe uh, by Roger Williams. Um, this engraving from the Library of Congress sort of shows the Native Americans being driven off their land, which was an all too frequent occurrence in the colonial era. You may wonder how such a small number of colonists were able to expand at the expense of the uh, indigenous Americans, and it's actually not that hard to figure out. Uh, most of it's related to technology. Uh, the colonists had guns and steel weapons, and the Native Americans were still, and, and a very organized hierarchy, where the Native Americans were largely still living in tribal societies, uh, didn't have very advanced weaponry, um, and also the, um, the spread of disease seemed to largely work one way, where the Native Americans would fall victim to the to colonist diseases, but not vice versa. Um, this again just shows some of the uh, Indian tribes um, in the early colonial days uh, with the colon, you know, with the existing colonies there. So first I'm going to show you these sort of existing colonies. We have the Salem colony, uh, the Boston colony, otherwise at this point known as the Massachusetts colony, uh, the West Augusset, um colony uh, in what's now the town of Weymouth, which is a suburb of Boston, uh, the Plymouth colony. Uh, in Rhode Island we have the Providence colony, uh, Chavanet colony, and the Newport colony, all of which, well, Chavanet is now a town. Newport is now a city, and Providence is now the major city in Rhode Island. Um, we see in the Connecticut River Valley sort of this string of settlements, which makes sense uh, considering it was a river valley, and river valleys were always useful for farming and trade and communication. So we see Hadley in Massachusetts, uh, Springfield um, also in Massachusetts, uh, Windsor, Hartford, uh, and old uh, Fort Saybrook now known as Old Saybrook down on the coast. Um, like I said, settlement was was sparse. So between Hadley and Boston, uh, you might have a number of settlements, uh, all very small, you know, all a few hundred people at most. Oops. Uh, and you see the New York colony. Um, which was not actually a British colony, it was a Dutch colony, uh, the New Amsterdam colony, uh, with New York, New Amsterdam as the main city, but also um, Fort Orange, uh, now known as Albany. Okay, so let's talk about John Winthrop. Um, he served as the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony for its first two decades. Um, he saw himself as struggling to live a um, godly life in a corrupt world. And that sort of sums up the Puritan religion. They saw themselves as godly, and they saw this world as corrupt. And um, they saw that their lives were a reflection of an attempt to overcome this corruptness. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Uh, but we must consider, and we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall have made a story and a byword 
to the world. In other words, as a godly people, it's their duty to establish a godly colony, and failing to do so would be them failing um, to to live up to this uh, godly life. What were families, farms, and communities like? Uh, at this point, I should mention that uh, I'm using a program called Screencast-O-Matic to record, which has a few benefits in the sense that um, you can you can hopefully see my face still down here, but I'm not sure because I can't see me. But it enables me to sort of show you what's on my screen to read from it. Uh, but the downside is the videos can only be about 15 minutes in length. Um, so I'm going to have to break the lecture at least into two videos, most likely three. Uh, but we'll, you know, see as we go. So let's talk about farm families and community. And remember, we're not talking about the... Um, Maryland colony or the Chesapeake Bay colonies or the Virginia colonies, all of which struggled with population. We're talking about the Massachusetts and uh, also the Providence, uh, otherwise known as the Rhode Island colonies. So um, although the, t the temperature was cooler in New England, uh, it was healthier because uh, the winters were, were cold but brief and the summers were long but not too warm which is actually a pretty good climate to grow crops. Um, and it also tends to keep, you know, tropical diseases at bay and waterborne diseases at bay, all of which plagued the colonies in the south. So there was a healthier climate. And um, also because these colonists were coming as religious colonists and not as economic colonists, there was a, a balanced sex ratio or a close to balanced sex ratio, which led to more stable families. So a combination of healthier climate, better crop yields, uh, more stable families led to much higher survival rates among children and longer lifespans among the colonists. Um, in the Massachusetts colonies and the New England colonies, the, the lifespan was probably closer to what it was in Europe, people living well into their 50s and 60s, uh, whereas in the Virginia and Maryland colonies, the lifespan was much shorter. The average male could expect to uh, live to about 40, which is a big difference, um, although it may not seem like it. Um, women were treated as secondary citizens, uh, partially because of the religious nature of these colonies, but also because this was sort of the uh, cultural frame at the time in Europe. Uh, women were legally and economically dependent upon their husbands. Uh, marriage was a contract in which the woman entered into and gave up a part of her freedom in order to um, have sort of protection and uh, financial solvency, so to speak. Uh, women generally didn't hold jobs per se, uh, but they could contribute to a family's success through household production, cottage industry, you know, making things at home to sell, uh, like knitting you know, clothes to sell, uh, weaving clothes to sell, uh, pr food production, you know, from the family farm, and also through facilitating trade, uh, partially with other families and in, even with other communities. Um, so women were not legally or economically free, but they had a lot of responsibility, which led to women occupying a more respected role in society than they did in, say, mainland Europe or um, even the Virginia colonies. Uh, I already talked about how you know, most towns were small uh, and there were a lot of them. Uh, the towns were trading centers and most trade was done with other towns uh, within the colony, although there was trade on the coast with Britain. Um, the towns were kind of built in a mold of each other, where they all had a meeting house which served as both a place of worship and a seat of the government which sort of reinforces the connection between uh, religion and government in the early colonies. So I'm going to stop this video here, and uh, a little bit later I'm going to make the second part of this video. Uh, I'm going to say again, at least two parts, possibly three.